Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. The reason I began to think I wanted to write about this topic is I felt genuinely conflicted, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this. I was profoundly confused as to what I thought about democracy, because on the one hand, I couldn't think there was any alternative. I'd got used to living in what we call a democracy. I wasn't aware that any of the systems that are historically put up to rival it could rival it. I had a relatively sure confidence that in the long run, democracy is better for the people who live under it. And then I looked at how democracy worked in the Western world, and it scared me to death. And I couldn't understand how to reconcile that underlying confidence that I had, and I think most people have, that democracy is the only game in town, with the way that democracies behave day to day, week to week, month to month, even year to year. The confusion, the short-termism, the scandals, the bickering, the partisanship, the sense of disillusionment among the public. How do you put those two stories together, that the long-term success story and the constant feeling that democracy isn't working? I looked to the past, and I thought I would look at two things, one of which was past crises, to see how people grappled with this question in the past. Did they feel the same? Was there that same feeling, uh, we'll muddle through? Was there an equivalent or even greater panic that it really doesn't work? But also looking at the history of ideas, the history of what people have said about what democracy is and how it works really in the round, to see if anyone had an account of democracy that made sense of this puzzle that I felt in myself, this genuine uncertainty. So who, who can explain that, that sense of uncertainty? And the person, about halfway through writing the book, actually not at the beginning, I didn't begin with this person in mind, but halfway through writing the book, the person who seemed to me to have the clearest, broad framework for thinking about this puzzle was Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville, the great French writer about American democracy in the 1830s and then about French politics as well. Tocqueville's a complicated, controversial figure, much debated. But there are some sort of aphoristic insights, some key, just basic ideas that seem to me to capture something about democracy that's not often captured by other grand theorists of democracies. Tocqueville goes to America, and one of the things he notices about American democracy is that it keeps making mistakes, and it also keeps correcting its mistakes. So one of his lines is, more mistakes get made in a democracy, and more mistakes get corrected in a democracy. So any given moment, it's going wrong. But in the long run, its adaptability, its restlessness, its kind of frenetic energy means that it never gets stuck with the mistakes it makes. And he thought this was particularly typical of American democracy. It was almost its defining characteristic. And he came to the conclusion, as he said in Democracy in America, that at first sight, at first encounter, it seems like it doesn't work. In the long run, it seems like it does. So there's a mismatch between the immediate experience of it and its long-term effects. Well, the simplest way to put it is, I think Tocqueville's basic insight into democracy is that it's better than it looks. Charles Dickens, a classic example, goes there, thinks it's a lovely idea, travels around and thinks under the surface it's horrible. Hypocritical, slave-owning, thuggish society. Tocqueville was the other way around. Look at democracy on any given day, and you will find politicians squabbling, and you'll think, how did they get into office? And you'll see political parties trimming, and you'll see politicians lying and cheating and behaving badly, all in the name of the people, and you'll see these high ideals being abused. That's what Tocqueville thought he found. But in the long run, that system, with its restlessness and its energy and its adaptability, the ways in which the politicians trim, the ways in which actually they don't stick to their principles, that's what saves it. Tocqueville's view was it's the systems where you get monarchs or autocratic rulers who feel pre-committed to some ideology that they've bought into and they have to stick to it, which are better in the short run, worse in the long run. But I think Tocqueville's genius, actually, were not those insights, though I think it's quite impressive he got there in 1831. It's his insight into the psychological effects of living with a system like that, a system that's better than it looks or works in the long run, but in the short term seems to keep making mistakes. Because he thought there are two ways that you could go if you were to live over time as a citizen under such a system. One is that you could become complacent. Because if things are never as bad as they look, you can assume that you will always muddle your way out. You learn that though 
at any given moment, it looks like your politicians have screwed up monumentally. Luckily, it's a democracy, so we'll chuck that lot out, get another lot in, we'll force them to change, they'll adapt, they won't stick to their principles, they've made a mistake. So if George W. Bush in 2008 it took him 20 minutes from Lehman Brothers to go down to ditch all of his ideological principles about free markets. That only happens in democracies. Actually, politics becomes less important for people who live under a system like that because they think the system will take care of itself. They can occasionally complain and it will correct. But the other feature, he thought, was an almost inevitable effect of living under such a system was impatience and frustration and anger and popular rage because you're told that democracy works in the long run, but it never seems to work in the moment. It never delivers in the sense that the delivery is always deferred and never quite what you expected and not quite what anyone intended. As the politicians chop and change and trim, you're rescued from the mistakes you find a solution, but it's never that solution that appears at the moment when you need it and fits the space that the, the problem seems to create. And that will produce popular anger, so not just disengagement, but real frustration. And it will produce popular movements that are disgusted with democracy and want to rescue it from the politicians who are ruining it and want to reclaim the pure version of it. And you see that at the moment as well. And for Tocqueville, in a way, the problem is finding some space between complacency and frustration. And it's a very narrow space. I mean, the ideal space is democracies are engaged enough and galvanized enough not to drift into this sort of it'll be all right in the end mindset, but not so engaged and so galvanized that they feel the disgust that almost all citizens feel with democracy when they encounter it. And if we think we're disgusted, you just have to read the history of the last hundred years to know that people are always disgusted with democracy, with their politicians. There's never a golden age where people went, yes, we've got the politicians we want and we deserve. One of the things I discovered in researching this book, in looking for crises in the 20th century, is that I can find you a crisis of democracy literature, not just for every decade, but for almost every year of the 20th century, including the years you might think were the good ones in the 20s or the 50s, or even, as I show in the book, the 1980s. So one of my crisis years is 1989, which was the year of democracy's triumph, but what people were writing at the time was, oh my God, it doesn't work. So there's never a kind of moment where people think it makes sense. So how do you find that space? And, and then I tried to connect my two stories by thinking, well, do crises occupy that space? Is a crisis, and by crisis I mean a war, an economic crisis, maybe an environmental threat, the challenge of a rival system, is a crisis a moment when democracies are kind of galvanized out of their complacency, they have this sense there are really serious threats and risks. But because it's a crisis, that sort of somewhat superficial frustration melts away and people start to sort of take the long view and think seriously. And Tocqueville himself thought about this and thought, he actually speculated on the question, maybe what America needs is a really serious crisis to wake it up. But the fear for Tocqueville is that crises don't occupy the space between complacency and impatience, that crises just produce more complacency and more impatience. And that, on the whole, is what I found. That crises didn't, it, that famous line that's now associated with Rahm Emanuel, never let a crisis go to waste, that sort of thought that there's a moment in a democratic system where it's exactly scary enough that politicians and the public can come together to rectify the system. Those moments are vanishingly rare. Maybe Franklin Roosevelt in 1933 is an example of that. Unlike any other democratic politician I can think of, he was completely nerveless about crisis. Roosevelt was elected in November, as American presidents always are. But back then, there were five months between election and inauguration. And Hoover said to Roosevelt, well, now that you're going to be president, you better tell people what your plan is, or otherwise the world is going to go down the toilet. Uh, you know, the world is falling apart around our feet, and we've got to do something about it. And Roosevelt said, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to be tainted by you or your regime. I'm going to wait until I'm president. So for five months, among the most dangerous five months in modern political history, Roosevelt did nothing. So that when he assumed office in May, it was so bad, the situation was so utterly terrifying, that he had the space to make the decisive structural shift, which is what he did. So that sort of crisis, which is just right, is very, very rare. 1918 was a terrifying year for Western democracy because for the first half of 1918, it was widely assumed that the democracies had lost the First World War because the Russian Revolution had happened, Lenin had effectively surrendered, 
the Bolsheviks had withdrawn. The German army had defeated its enemies in the east, and so it could turn all its attention west. It broke through the trenches. It was marching on Paris. Paris emptied of citizens. It was widely assumed Paris was going to fall. Haig issued his famous order that we must fight to the last man. This thing was going down. There was panic in London. There was panic in Washington. There was total panic in Paris. French politics was in chaos. It had been churning through prime ministers because it was a democracy. People were saying, we're going to lose this war because the Germans are not a democracy. They've got this tough autocratic system which has promoted Ludendorff. Hindenburg is in charge. They're not mucking around. with. They were, of course, terrified of public opinion in Germany. But the view from the West was these decisive autocrats, they're just going to run rings around us. But actually, what happened, autocrats, when they go wrong, they can't adapt their way out of it. When the German offensive failed, there was no plan B. What the Western democracies were doing, which looked so horrible at the time, chopping and changing their leaders, firing generals, not deciding on a plan, squabbling among themselves, was frantically adapting. And the Western democracies, Britain, America, France, won the First World War because they were more adaptable. But because they were more adaptable, when they won the war, there was that moment of thinking, this is the moment of truth for democracy. Now the crisis has produced the decisive outcome, the victory of democracy. If you're Woodrow Wilson, you think, now we can seize our moment to make the world safe for democracy. This is the moment of democratic destiny. And what did the Western democracies do? They kept chopping and changing and adapting and muddling through. So the attempt then to turn the victory into a decisive success didn't work, because the things that had allowed the democracies to win the war also ensured that they would squander their victory, because they cannot grip the moment. There were elections. Party politics got in the way. The national interest got in the way. It turned out the voters were much more concerned about prices and jobs than they were about global peace. It's very hard to win an election with your slogan being global peace. That's how democracy seems to be to work. And I think that pattern repeats through to the most recent crisis. And I think you see in the crisis since 2008 various aspects of this, both the complacency, the stumbling into the crisis, the adaptation, which has been remarkable. The euro, it, at any given moment, it looks like it's about to go under. And yet somehow, by politicians essentially ditching their principles, adjusting to the electoral cycle in such a way as just and now to leave themselves enough room. I mean, Angela Merkel is clearly a genius at this. We're muddling through. And there is some reassurance to be taken from that story, which is that at various points in the last 100 years, it looked like Western democracy was finished. And just at the moment when it looked like it was finished tend to be the moment where the key adaptation is about to take place. And then there's a cumulative story, which is what do you learn from that whole 100 years? Because the cumulative story could be a build-up within the system of a great deal of complacency and also a build-up within the system of a great deal of impatience. Because what we have now is, on the one hand, the lessons from all these past crises are one of the reasons that the crisis of 2008 never got as bad as the crisis of 19, the early 1930s up to 1933, is because famously, as the technocrats who managed the crisis said, we've got the example of the 1930s to draw on. We are not going to make those mistakes again. We are not going to allow the banks to go bust. We are not going to, say, liquidate everything, and then we can start again. We're going to prop up these failing institutions to prevent the worst from happening. So th as it were, there's, there's a whole history of adaptation for present democracies to draw on. There's also now, unlike in those previous crises, really no alternative. Now, there is very little appetite, it seems to me, in these crisis-stricken, which they are democracies in Europe, Britain, in America, and including in places like Japan, an appetite for some radical ideological alternative. There are alternatives out there. Chinese state capitalism is not democratic. No one could mistake that for a democracy. It's a real alternative. It has many adherents in parts of the world, including increasingly in Africa. We have Russell Brand, whose proposal is that we should disengage from politics. Now, that is not a radical alternative to the present system. Um, and under those circumstances, it must be possible that the frustration will really build up, because many of the outlets that might be there are not there. That is, the possibility of organizing around an alternative. The complacency and the frustration may both be building up. And then it's also possible that the threats are different from in the past. So just take one example. I mean, climate change, it's not clear to me that muddling through is a solution to the problem of climate change. If there is a 30, 40, 50 year time lag, between our action now and the runaway effects over which we discover we do not have the control.
to, to rectify the worst of the damage, muddling through will not be a solution because the moment when we wake up where we adapt may well be the moment where it's too late. And that is not true of any of the crises that I talked about in the past. There's a frustration, there's an impatience, there may also be a complacency and underlying complacency, which means that the present situation is different. The cumulative story is different from the cyclical story, that we've now reached the end point of a long cycle of adaptation, repeated crisis adaptation, and that a more decisive break is coming. And if that's true, then I'm not sure history is any good. This is where I can say, I have no idea, I haven't answered my question. Is democracy going to survive the 21st century? Because I think history is a good guide to some of the dynamics, the psychology of it. I'm not sure necessarily it is a guide to the present predicament of democracy, because in some res crucial respects, it is possibly more stuck in that kind of topfill, dangerous topfill dynamic of complacency and frustration than it has been at any point in the past. There isn't much in your about, about, as it were, how democracy is changing. And yeah. many people would argue, for example, that one of the big shifts in democracy over the last 30 or 40 years has been the move away from a kind of class-based politics to a politics which is very much more consumerist and driven yeah. by uh, you know, fighting in the center ground, triangulation, focus groups, yeah. all that kind of life. I read you talking about that. So yeah. what are the changes that are taking place in democracy, yeah. despite the fact that you're noticing these similarities across this historical yeah. period? Well, I mean, that is part of the adaptation, of course, in that our democracy is nothing like the one that Tocqueville encountered. And I'm aware, as, as Tocqueville does in his book, that you talk about democracy as though it were a single thing. It's absolutely not a single thing. It's no longer even a single thing in Scotland and in England, never mind in Britain and Japan. It's, it changes in complex ways all the time. But there are these broad shifts that maybe ha don't happen in 10 to 15 year cycles, but as you say, happen over 30 to 40 year cycles tied to technology. But does that change the equation? Because if you're saying that democracy is not very good, for example, at kind of long-term right. stuff. There is an argument that says it's got much worse at long-term stuff because deference has declined, yeah. class allegiance has declined, yeah. people are much more footloose in their voting behaviours. We have 24-hour media, and so that, that flaw, yeah. which was a manageable flaw, has now become an impossible flaw. I mean, was David Ronovich this morning was just writing, and you know, one of these articles you see all the time, yeah, you do. saying you can't solve A and E, and you can't solve HS2, and you can't solve any of these problems because, in the end, politicians aren't willing to make decisions which will hurt for the next few years but pay off in for, I mean, our, gonna, for our children. I mean, I would give a boring answer, which is the boring historian's answer, which is you should see what they were saying in the <laughs> 1930s, the 1890s. It's the perennial complaint: How can these leaders take the long-term decisions? I mean, it, there's actually, it's always a double complaint, actually, traditionally, and this may have changed. Say, in the 1930s, the, the complaint was, they're so worried about elections, they can't take long-term decisions. But also, they're so indecisive, they can't take short-term decisions like dictators can. <laughs> it's too slow and it's too quick. You do hear some of that now. It, it's both, it's a sort of 24-hour cycle. It's that sort of jitteriness, and yet they're not able to take that long view. The technology has clearly changed it. The professionalization, not just of political parties, which has been happening over the last 100 years, but particularly of the ways in which political parties canvass for votes. And the, the means of being able to do that are so much more sophisticated than they were. So yes, it is, it is harder. It's not as though this is a new problem, though. Um, there ought to be positives to this, right? In that the technology ought to make possible one of those complaints about democracy, which is that in the moment, if Tocqueville's word for it is, is it, it's untimely. It never is there at the time that it's needed. And at the dawn of the IT revolution, there was lots of utopian stuff. No, about how we were, we, you know, everyone remembers it, right? It's, no, not, it's, not, it's dystopian now. That utopia has become the sort of current dystopia about surveillance society. But it was originally, go home in the evening, click on your computer and vote in a referendum about the things that matter to you. That, that hasn't come to pass. The technology at least makes it more conceivable than in the past. But I agree with you in a sense that it, I think it's the heightened version of what was there before. The long-term decision-making is very, very difficult because of the electoral cycle. The short-term thing is so fragmented and chaotic. The thing that people want, which is decisiveness, seems to be missing from the system. 